Now, the, one of the most fundamental questions that we can ask ourselves as human beings is how did we get here? What is it that has caused our, our very existence and all the things that we can see around us? Now, it's my firm belief that the earth and everything on it and the universe was created by God. A God who is all powerful, has always existed and will always exist and has made everything that we see around us. And God has revealed this to us through his word, the Bible. You'll be familiar most likely with the first words of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, where it states, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible is, is full of statements about how God is our creator. So here's uh, one of those from the Psalms, from Psalm 33, uh, reading from verse 6, where it says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth at the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. So these words tell us that by the word of the Lord, by the word of God, the heavens and everything else was made. And this psalm demands that as a result of God being our creator, that we show him respect, that we stand in awe at what God has done. So what we'd like to do um, in these few minutes in this talk is to, to stand in awe at some of the things that God has made. And, and we're going to have a think about the greatness of the, the planets, the sun and the stars. And we're also going to briefly consider some of the aspects of, of life on this planet as well. Well, scientists tell us that the key requirement for life on Earth is the availability of water. And that's not just water as a, a gas or in its solid state as frozen, uh, but water in its in its liquid state. Uh, and this world, planet Earth, has a great abundance of, of water. In fact, around two thirds of the Earth is covered by by waters in the form of the seas. Now, this is a, a phenomenon that we perhaps just take for granted. We're, we're very used to it. We've grown up with it. But this is only possible because the Earth is very conveniently located at just the right distance from the sun. And what scientists tell us is that the Earth is in what's called the Goldilocks zone, or as it shows on the slide, the, the habitable zone. See, planet Earth, it's currently moving very, very fast. In fact, um, you might not realise it, but we're currently travelling at some 67,000 miles per hour through space. And every year, the Earth travels some 93 million miles around the sun in the process. And if the Earth was closer to the sun, then all the water on Earth would evaporate and burn off due to the extra heat. If the Earth was farther from the sun, all the water would be frozen and would make life very difficult indeed. But the Earth is just the right distance and, and just the right angle of the Earth's rotation so that we have our seasons, we have our warmer summers and our slightly colder winters, but not too extreme that life cannot live. We also find that the sun around which this Earth orbits it gives off a huge amount of energy in fact every second the sun gives enough energy to power all human energy needs for 500,000 years that's how much energy the sun produces but the sun's energy is incredibly constant it doesn't suddenly get hot and then suddenly get cold it gives us just the right amount of energy for life to survive and thrive on planet Earth. Now, orbiting the Earth is the moon. And the moon is, is just the right distance from the Earth to provide just the right gravitational pull so that the tides of the sea can come in and out, which is very important to um, life in, in that area. Now, if the moon was much closer to the Earth, the gravity pull would be 
so much so that the, the tides uh, wouldn't function uh, or if they were farther away, uh, then that wouldn't work either. And it's also interesting that the moon is just the right distance from the Earth, that when the moon goes in front of the sun, it matches the size of the sun exactly. So we find that the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but 400 times closer. And this match is so perfect that when there is an eclipse, we can see the corona of the sun. That's not a virus, by the way, but the, the outer areas of the sun. It matches perfectly. Now, the Earth and the Moon is, is part of a, a system of planets um, called, of course, the, the solar system, system. And the various planets all orbit the sun in uh, great harmony. In fact, the larger planets act as a kind of shield to the Earth. They help stop comets and asteroids hitting the Earth, which if that were to happen, that would be rather limiting for life on this planet. And because of the way the um, planets orbit the sun, we can very accurately predict the trajectory of these celestial beings. And, and we can observe great comets that orbit around the sun. And these things are, are so predictable that we can use them uh, in terms of our own clocks and calendars. Now, in 1687, this man, Isaac Newton, he discovered the, the laws of gravity that govern the planets, and he was able to mathematically compute their orbits and properties. And, and one of the great books that Newton wrote, some say the greatest book of science ever, was a book called the Principia Mathematica. And in the scholium, or in the introduction, Newton said this. He said that though these bodies, speaking of the planets, may indeed continue in their orbits by the mere laws of gravity, yet they could by no means have at first derived the regular position of the orbits themselves from those laws. Thus this most beautiful system of the sun, planets and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. So Newton, when he looked into the heavens, he could see order and he could see laws at work and he realized that those laws couldn't have placed the planets there in the first place and those laws of gravity are so finely tuned that something must have created them and newton calls this the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being now since the the time of newton uh, our ability to look up into the heavens to go into space itself and put uh, telescopes into space and uh, delve into the deepest reaches of the of the universe has greatly increased. So we now know today that our solar system forms just a, a small part of a galaxy uh, called the Milky Way. Now the Milky Way is absolutely massive. It's between 100 to 120,000 light years across. Now, I'm going to try and explain that uh, distance if I can. Um, in one second, light can go around our Earth seven times. And it takes 8.3 minutes for light to get from the sun to the Earth. Now, if you could travel at the speed of light, it would take you 100,000 years to go from one side of the Milky Way to the other. And this Milky Way is, is packed full with stars uh, similar to our sun. And it's been estimated that in the Milky Way that there are between 200 to 400 billion stars. Now, if we take the, uh, the lower number, 200 billion, if you could count one number a second, it would take you 6,341 years to count all the stars in the Milky Way. Well, let's see what the Bible has to say about this, because in Psalm 147, again, speaking of the greatness of God, it says in verse four that he telleth the number of the stars, so God can count the stars, and not only can he count them, but he calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power, his understanding is infinite. And how true those words are, that God can name all of the stars and he can count them. 
And there's something even more amazing than the stars that are in the Milky Way, uh, because the Milky Way is a galaxy. And what astronomers have found is that there are many, many galaxies in the universe. And uh, there's a NASA slide showing uh, some of the shapes uh, of some of those galaxies which astronomers have found. And it's estimated that there are more than 170 billion galaxies in the universe. Now, some of those galaxies have more stars than the Milky Way, some have less. So when we extrapolate that and try and estimate the number of stars that are in the universe, we get this colossal number, 100 uh, with 21 noughts after it. It's a uh, 100 uh, sextillion. Uh, and uh, my mind is blown by that incomprehensibly large number of stars. Now, to try and um, think about what that number might actually mean, um, let's compare it to something that we're all familiar with on Earth, and that is sand. We've all been on the beach. We've all picked up uh, a handful of sand. In fact, I'm sure we've all made a sand castle, and a small sand castle um, if you counted the grains of sand in a small sandcastle, it would be at least a billion uh, grains of sand in a small sandcastle, so a large number. And I want you for a moment just to think about all the grains of sand, not just in a small sandcastle, but on a whole beach. Then think about all the grains of sand on all the beaches in the UK, and then think about all the grains of sand on all the beaches in all the world. And then add in all the grains of sand that are in all the deserts of the world. And then I want you to ask yourself the question, are there more grains of sand on the earth than stars? Or are there more stars than grains of sand? And the answer is that there are more stars than grains of sand. It, it's an estimate. Nobody's actually counted or been able to count either of these. But that's what scientists suggest. So the scale and size of the universe is absolutely mind boggling. Now, popular science would have us believe that this great vastness of the universe and all those stars and all that matter that is in it originally came from nothing. That about 14 billion years ago, nothing simply exploded in the form of the Big Bang. And that's how all these stars came about and all the planets that are in this great universe came into existence. Now, does that really make sense to you? Well, when we look into the universe, do we see the hand of a supreme and all-powerful creator? Well, let's uh, go to the very small scale. Let's take things back down to this earth and let's start off by thinking about water. Um, I'm sure we all know that, the, uh, that water has the molecular uh, compound of H2O. That's a water molecule. It's made up of two uh, hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Now, here's an interesting fact. Did you know that there are more water molecules, H2O, in 10 drops of water than stars in the universe. And so what we find in nature is the things that are very, very small are as baffling and perhaps even more so than the greatness of the universe is itself. And planet Earth on which uh, we live is, as far as we are aware, unique as it's the only world to our knowledge that has life on it. And the variety of life on planet Earth is, is truly astonishing and, and wonderfully beautiful. Life is found all over Earth, from the depths of the Marina Trent, where an uh, unusual creature called a brochulid has been found at a depth of 8,299 metres, uh, way up into the skies where a Ruppel's griffin has known to fly at 11,250 metres. That's a couple of thousand metres higher uh, than, than Mount Everest. And, and everything in between, life is found. There are over 8,000 species of birds. 
uh, 10,000 different species of reptiles or amphibians, over a million different species of invertebrate animals and 4,000 different species of mammals. And this completely excludes the abundance of life in the seas. In fact, scientists estimate that there are anything between 500,000 to a million marine species of life that are yet to be discovered. And we haven't spoken about the vegetation on uh, the earth either. Now, the greatest of all the living creatures on this planet is, is mankind himself. And, and there are now approximately 7.6 billion humans alive on planet Earth today. And each and every human being is absolutely incredible. From the way we can walk and run to the processing power of our brains, to the ability to use our eyes, to see, our ears to hear, our noses to smell, our skin to touch. It is a, a, a marvel, human life, as indeed all life is a marvel. But what constitutes a human or indeed what constitutes any life? Well, at its very base level, we're made from the dust of the ground, just as the Bible teaches us that God formed man from the dust of the ground. And so at the atomic level, we are indeed made of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen, plus a few elements that are essential for life as well. Now, the real building blocks for life is the cell. And in the human body, uh, the human body has many different types of cells, and it's estimated that the, the average a uh, fully grown uh, human uh, has something like 30 trillion cells that go in to make up the human body. Now, that in itself is astonishing, especially when we consider that we started off life in our mother's womb as just one cell or two cells that come together to make that one cell. And that one cell has multiplied and multiplied over and over to the 30 trillion cells that make us what we are today. So is the human cell, or indeed any cell that might go into creating a life, a simple or a complicated structure? Well, modern science has demonstrated to us that the cell, although it's very, very, very small, is actually very, very complicated. Now, I'm not a biologist. I'm not going to be able to explain to you how the cell uh, works, um, but I'm just going to focus on one aspect of the cell, and that's what's called the, the DNA. You see it on the chart there in the, in the center of, the, um, of, of that cell. And I'm going to quote from Wikipedia as to what DNA um, is and does. And Wikipedia says that uh, DNA is a molecule composed of two polynucleotide chains that call around each other to form a double helix, carrying genetic instructions for the development, functioning, growth, and reproduction of all known organisms and many viruses. And so DNA is, is very compact and it's an incredibly efficient way of storing information. In fact, DNA is the information of life. And within each cell, if you unraveled the uh, DNA uh, helix and uh, as scientists have done and, and decoded it, you, you have the information that makes us who we are today and gives the information as to how cells are created and all the different aspects to do with uh, life and to do with our bodies. Now, the length of each DNA uh, chain in a cell, if we unraveled it, in each cell, it's about two meters long. And, and given how small and microscopically small a cell is, that is an incredible thing. And if we were to uh, uncoil all the DNA in a human and put it end to end, it would be incredibly thin, but it would be incredibly long. It would stretch some 10 billion miles. And that's enough for a round trip uh, to Pluto. And as we say, within each DNA strand is the information that is required for you to exist, for life to form, for cells to replicate, and to give us the characteristics of who we are Today, it's utterly, absolutely, and completely incredible. So I just want you to stop and think just for a moment, because we've considered the greatness of the stars of the universe, and we've pondered 
life on this planet and some of the amazing details of the very smallest structures that make up life. And I want you to ask the question, could this really have happened by chance? You see, to create a DNA chain, you need a very specific order of proteins and chains of amino acids to form in exactly the right order. It's like getting a pair of dice and hitting a six, but not just hitting a six once, it's hitting a six over and over and over again. Now, if we take a, a normal dice, one that's not uh, weighted in any way, a six-sided dice, and uh, we know that the probability of hitting a six once, it's one in six. Now, the probability of doing it again, it's one in six times one in six, so it's one in 36, and then it multiplies on again and again. Now, to roll a dice and get a six 50 times in a row, that's the probability. It's one in that very long number, and that very long number has 33 digits in it. It's considerably more than all the stars in the universe. And I would suggest to you that to get life, you need to throw a six many, many more times than 50 times in a row. But is it conceivably possible that life could have just happened by chance, like the roll of a dice? Well, I would suggest to you that the answer to that is no, that all these things point to the greatness, they point to design, they point to intelligence. And, and the Bible gives us the answer as to who did this. That in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it's in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 that we're told, for the invisible things of him, that's speaking of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And, and the Bible tells us that God is revealed in two great books. He's revealed in the Bible and also in the book of nature. So when we see the amazing things in creation, when we look at the size and greatness of the universe, we can see the hand of God. And when we look at the microscopic level, at the basis of life, we also see the hand of God. So God is clearly seen in the things that he has created so that we are without excuse. So why did God create all these things? What's the purpose? Well, Isaiah 45 and verse 18 tells us, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So God has created this earth with a purpose. He's created this earth to be inhabited. And God has revealed his plan and purpose with this earth. He wants human beings to be like him. Not that we can be the creator, only God can do that. But we can follow his character. We can be like him in the way that we act and how we treat each other. And he's given us the example of his son to follow, who was the perfect manifestation of God and who has given us his life, that we might have the hope of living forever in God's kingdom. So let's finish then by just thinking about God's creation and the wonder of it. And I'm going to quote some words from Psalm 148, where it says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise ye him all his angels, praise him all his hosts, praise ye him sun and moon, praise him all ye stars of light, praise him ye stars of heavens and ye waters that be above the heavens, let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. So all of the creation praises God and its wonder and in its magnificence. And our, our hope and prayer is that you listening might also find a way to praise your creator because he's promised to save you through his son. And he's given us that wonderful opportunity to live forever in his kingdom to come. Thanks very much.